Welcome to Midco Sports Magazine. Great stories of sport and achievement from a little off the beaten path. This month, a college basketball player who racked up some big numbers in games, partly because he racked up big numbers in his own private practices. We'll have some fun with Nate's numbers. A gargantuan grandfather from Minnesota, a wrist wrestling champion who is armed and ready now for his next weightlifting competition. And speaking of lifting, lifting spirits takes on new meaning for the group in our first story. Their lift comes from within, with a little help from a ski lift and some volunteers. Jolene Letcher hits the slopes for the story. Here, you find the solitude of the soul, a breadth of hills and horizon that swallows your breath and fills the spirit. Mother Nature's majesty and magic creating a calm from within. Holy crap! <laughs> Cutting through the crisp of the air on this Saturday in February at Great Bear Park near Sioux Falls, the energy of unleashing the unexpected and the excitement of uncertainty. Today's going to be a big day. A first of its kind day here. Today's going to be a lot of new. For the first time, an entire day of adaptive skiing, where trained volunteers equipped with sitting skis take to the slopes. Being a part of their lesson, uh, it really encourages a sense of freedom. I think going from a wheelchair and, and having a slower paced life, it seems like to all of a sudden releasing them to 20, 30 miles an hour on a ski slope is, uh, is pretty freeing, pretty exciting. I've never skied in my life. Where in the peaks and valleys of life, the thrill of the downhill ride overcomes that rough path of the uphill battles of the past. Mm. <laughs> and I really go. The gear may muffle his grin, but it cannot mask Jim Kapperman's contagious smile. <laughs> well, top heavy. Yeah. Well, how do you say him? Tucked in, volunteers use ties to help control the skiers. But the steering, that is on Jim. How are you doing? Come on, Jim, steer it. I'm trying. <laughs> As he cruises and avoids any crashes on his first pass on the bunny hill, I'm in. it's a ride 56 years in the making. Back when I was younger, I was thinking about skiing and stuff, but I never took the time to do it. Now I finally do. Well, I guess I got the time and I did it, so. Didn't take the time because 15 years ago with two young daughters, a wife, work, and building his new house, time, well, it took care of itself until time stopped. A life-changing event, let me tell you. I was working that day and, you know, just in going along and we had a piece of new equipment we tried out. I got bucked out of the seat of the of the dozer and I hit my head on a roll cage and snapped my neck kind of, you know, and then I ended up in the seat just numb from the neck down. He didn't know then just how bad the bulldozer accident would be. Being you can't feel nothing, couldn't move nothing, couldn't, you know, all I could do was move my head from one side to the other. Four letter words couldn't hide the 12 letter word Jim would soon hear after that. I guess when I heard the doctor in the other room or in the hallway tell the wife, you might as well, you better kind of prepare yourself for a quadriplegic. That was a tough one. That was, a, I think I was awake the whole time up until about that time and then I heard that and then I kind of took a little nap after that. When he woke up. I was taking, I was talking to the good Lord. I said, you know, I got two daughters to walk down the aisle and I, I really want to do that. I want to be able to do that. I'm not quite done. There should be a way. A way because he willed it. It uh, took quite a bit. It was, it was when you're laying there and you can't move nothing and you're wondering what's going to be next and, and eventually, okay, a, a big toe moves a little bit. There's hope, you know. So then from there on, it was a, it was a long, hard journey. Three months in the hospital, a few holidays among those days, 18 months in rehab to also follow, along with new friends and a newfound philosophy on life. You can either live with your disability or you can die with it, so you gotta choose to live with it. Living like before, but even more than before. Fishing again, 
and now working out, lifting weights three times a week. His smile and jokes covering up a constant pain that only sleep relieves. I always got pain. Sometimes when I was rehabbing and stuff, they'd ask, what, what does it feel like? And I'd say, well, remember what Popeye's arms looked like? That's kind of what it feels like, heavy, big, swollen. But in the last year, Jim did what he asked God to let him do in that hospital room, putting the physical pain aside and doing what most dads dread, that painful task of giving your daughter away. Joyous, joyous, at ease, I did it. We, we made it down, I'm glad I gave my daughters off to two good guys and it was, it was great. It was a good feeling, one of the best feelings in the world. And Jim didn't wait for the reception to do a little dancing. Back at Great Bear with the bunny slope down. I, I walked my daughters down the aisle, which I wasn't supposed to do. I had a grandson. I shot my first buck in 16 years. So I guess the next stage is try skiing. Jim keeps spirits lifted. Put her up as he goes up the lift. <laughs> Here we go. We're business. You betcha. All right, first chairlift ride. Yep, first chairlift ride. How many years? Uh, 56. More than a half century of life experiences, those peaks and valleys that Jim hopes also helps lift another skier. And Mason Cohen? Yeah, yeah, right behind us. All right. His nephew Mason, one of the youngest skiers out today. And as he leads him on the lift, and in life, Jim hopes he learns. Hope, hope and keeps you going, keeps your, keeps your mood high, keeps it going. It's, you just, just living life is good to go, you know. And it keeps Jim going too. I feel different or I've, I've taken on more challenges and uh, I remember in the rehab about uh, getting off the floor or falling, you know, or something and then I said, you know, I, it, it's kind of tough, you know, little kids don't have this much trouble, you know. Well, they didn't have as far to fall, plus they got a nice cushion on their butt. So never short on one-liners, Jim lines up again. Yeah, you felt just like, yeah, I mean, just the, just the freedom and just the fun of, of getting to do something. Other than sit in a chair or walk stiff and hurt and pain, and the pain was gone. An entire day of peace from pain slicing through the silence of the slopes, and being reminded that the path of life, it doesn't always go straight, and what you find along the way matters more than what you leave behind. Joined by Jolene Letcher, and uh, great to see Jim get back on his feet literally after the accident. But adaptive skiing, which is what they were doing there, goes back to what point in history? Right after World War II, vets came home and those with injuries wanted to do what they did before the war, so they created adaptive skiing. And there might be some other kind of skiing in his future? He plans to water ski and get this, Tom, kayak. Very cool. Thank you, Jolene. Great story. Coming up next on Midco Sports Magazine, can you strap 300 pounds to your waist and do a dip? This guy can. He is 56 years old and still pulling his own weight and then some. We got to hand it to our next athlete. This guy can crush the competition, even those decades younger than him. Jason Andera takes us to Minnesota for more on this massive man. Buried under a sweatshirt. My name is Richard Lupkes. I'm from Rushmore, Minnesota. I am 56 years old. 
bundled up by a t-shirt. Some days young, some days old. Depends how I feel. Hidden by a humble smile. <laughs> Founding father of arm wrestling in Minnesota. Armed with heart. He's an average guy who is an average. You cannot be average when you hold dozens of arm wrestling championships won over more than 30 years. Won the world championship, uh, I think, three or four times. and I've won the nationals, I couldn't even tell you how many times, maybe 10, 12 times or so. He's what we call a freak. And, and I mean that with the serious, you know, I'm, I'm sincere on that. Uh, I think it was back in 76, we seen a poster hanging in a gas station here in Worthington. And it was on a Sunday afternoon and uh, looking for something to do, so we went up there and uh, got involved with it. And for Rich, it continued to be something to do. You know, um, a lot of people still associate it with something they do in the bar, but it's uh, really come a long way. And so did he. From Minnesota to around the world, he set the bar high, racking up wins and weights through the years. His humbleness, he doesn't really, <laughs> he doesn't flaunt it intentionally, but when you're built like that, what do you do? And he's just so down to earth. And this salt of the earth man seems to be an exception to the rules. He doesn't talk much about his wins and even less about the challenges that could have, should have weighed him down. He took time off in the 90s to farm and to be with his family. And then, just when he started his comeback about six years ago, he faced what for most would be a career ending setback. A story told by a scar you can sort of still see on his right arm. Yup, that arm, when his bicep tore. About that time, he met this guy. I'm Eric Youngbloom, um, from the Worthington area. I met Rich back in 07. Uh, we both love lifting and uh, love to push each other. And that's how we met. And we've been lifting together for the last 17 years. Not even a serious car accident kept Rich out of the ring, or rather, took arm wrestling off the table. Well, I just enjoy spending time in the gym. You know, I don't do it for arm wrestling. I don't do it for anything other than uh, enjoying the time. It makes me feel better. You know, I just try to stay in shape and, uh, you know, hopefully it'll make me live a little longer. He's got a good deep burn uh, desire to do the best he can, no matter what it is. Even on this Thursday during an average, but not so average several hour workout, when this six foot three grandfather of five, weighing in at a little more than 300 pounds, puts 310 pounds around his waist. Dipping down and pumping up his triceps. And in between, he tries a new trick. Flipping and catching 45 pound plates. If he wouldn't have gone into arm wrestling, he could have been probably one of the world's greatest strong men. Just because of the way he's built and his focus on when he gets down to doing something, he gets results. There's no doubt in my mind, he, if he applies himself, he'll get results. Okay, got it. Yep. Okay. The results on this day, well, Google World Record wrist curls, looks like 345 pounds might be the record. Today, Rich pulls down 500 pounds. No PR for this PR, other than personal pride. Well, it's 30-some uh, years later. It's, uh, I'm still trying to compete. It's getting harder. While Father Time may make it harder for this father of arm wrestling. Uh, I was the oldest guy competing. The next guy in my class was probably 30, you know, 35. So I got him by 20 years. In March, he made it to the finals of the 2013 Arnold Classic in Ohio. And everybody that's at the Arnold is uh, basically a former national or world champion. So the, the contestants are, are really good. I took third place, which uh, probably doesn't sound that great, but I have to go against all the young guys. Coming to grips with getting older doesn't bother this big guy. He always figures this part of his figure could get even bigger. I always say they're not big enough, so. <laughs> I suppose they're cold around 23, you know, maybe a shade older. Well, some may wear their heart on their sleeve, 
finding a sleeve to fit this recently retired farmer. I let my wife do all the shopping. I have no idea where she goes or how she does it, but she does it for me, so. So while it may take a four or five XL to fit these biceps. Well, my wife sees it more than I do. You know, she says that people are looking, but they don't really look at me when I'm looking at them. So, I mean, she sees it a little more. Rich doesn't see it, but when we go out and stuff, Rich gets a lot of attention because in, in my world, and I did power lifting and, and did a lot of that strength, and he's a one percenter. You know, I don't see it. I mean, I see myself like everybody else, and so I guess, uh, you know, I don't think I'm that much different than anybody else, really. Uh, he's, yeah, just the one percenter. I might be a little heavier than them, but uh, probably because I eat too much. And in the future, he wrestles with what comes next. You know, I don't know. You know, there's a few other things that uh, I've been kicking around, thinking about trying. It keeps the fire going, you know. And, you know, not just the arm wrestling. He's, he's been talking and, uh, about setting a world bench press record, so we're we're kind of leaning towards that and working at that now. A friend of mine wants me to do a bodybuilding show. Another guy wants me to do a bench press contest. So I might, you know, try one of those just to uh, see how it goes. I'm hoping he'll have a few more world records attached to his name. If he decides to play with others his own age, normally he doesn't. It's always fun to uh, push the envelope a little bit. There's not a lot of people that I've seen with his abilities and goes beyond the abilities. Almost like a superhero. A superhero armed with heart and humbleness. A member of the AARP. <laughs> <laughs> Joined by Jason and Dara now, and I understand that Rich recently sold his farm, but he's still doing some work as a personal trainer, and he's still got a lot of work to do in these arm wrestling competitions, too. Yeah, he talked about some other challenges and goals that he has for his career, but he wants to get a few things done in arm wrestling still. The Nationals later this year in Wisconsin, and then if he qualifies, on to the World Championship in Poland. Got to believe he'll do just fine, huh? Hey, story, man. Right. Thanks, Jason and Dara. Up next, some fun with Nate's numbers, some astounding stats on a Walters workout when we come back. Nate Walters just finished up one of the great college basketball careers ever in South Dakota, and part of his legend were his late night workouts. And do we romanticize those a little bit too much? Probably. Did they make him the player that he became, though? Absolutely. The numbers are projections, maybe a little bit silly, but they give you a great idea of the extra effort that this kid put in. He broke the SDSU scoring record that had stood for 28 years. He broke the assist record that had stood for 14. And he broke the record for points in one game that had stood since 1973. He is quick, he is crafty, and he is unbelievably dedicated. I get the question a lot, what's he like off the floor? And I say, I don't know, because he's never off the floor. Nate doesn't feel right if, if he hasn't been in the gym shooting. It's just kind of a rhythm thing for him. It's part of who he is, and he wouldn't feel right if he wasn't up here at night shooting. Almost every night for the past three seasons, Nate Walters has been here. For the most part, just him and his roommate and rebounder, Austin Miller. Walters claims that they took a rest from this routine for five days in a row once. Miller says, <laughs> that is definitely a lie. He says maybe three days in a row. Otherwise, they have been here, night in, night out, 
but rarely a night off. I have never met anybody who's willing to be here constantly, night in, night out, no matter how tired he is. He wants to be here. I kind of switch it up every couple weeks. I'll do the same type of workouts. I'm um, just trying to get as many game shots as possible, shots that I'll think I'll take in the game and try to do it game speed. So, I mean, I think it helps more mentally than anything, just knowing that you're prepared. He doesn't shoot for a certain amount of time or even a certain number of shots. He shoots for a certain number of makes. He shoots to make 400 shots a night. Three-point shots, pick-and-roll jump shots, and the floater, the runner, the nader on the escalator that has become his signature shot. On this night, we estimate he makes two-thirds of the shots he takes. So if he is making 400, he is taking 600. Now, if you take 600 shots six nights a week, that is 3,600 shots per week. And that is 187,200 extra shots per year. To take it a little further, he has racked up some serious distance if you count the total travel on all of those shots. If he takes 200 shots from 22 feet, 200 shots from 15 feet, and 200 shots from 7 feet out, that is 9,500 feet or 1.8 miles per night. Times 6, that is 10.8 miles per week and over 561 miles of shots per year. That is enough to get him home to St. Cloud, Minnesota, and back to Brookings, and back to St. Cloud again. Now what about weight? An NCAA men's basketball weighs about 22 ounces. At 600 shots per night, that is 825 pounds per night that he is heaving toward the hoop. That is 4,950 pounds per week, which equals 257,400 pounds per year, which means that he is chucking up over 128 tons of basketball per year. That's about 18 full-grown elephants, or 26,000 full-grown jackrabbits. And finally, what about the hours? If you figure that he is in here for two hours a night, six nights a week, and say 50 weeks a year, that is 600 extra hours of practice per year. That is 25 full days of dedication. 25 full days of extra effort. And those are Nate's numbers. Well, 27 is the next number to keep track of for Nate Walters. June 27th is the NBA draft this year, and all indications are right now that a pro team is definitely going to take a shot at Walters sometime in those two rounds of the draft. Well, thanks to Nate Walters, Austin Miller, Jim Kapperman, uh, Rich Lepkes. Thank you for watching Midco Sports Magazine. We'll see you next time.